Mitchell has his head up, takes the oh, oh, Welcome to the Junkyard Pod. I'm your host, Tony Pesta, joined by Jackson Flickinger and Corey Walsh. You can find all the links to our work in the description, but today we are going to discuss the Cleveland Cavaliers' most recent loss to the Miami Heat. It was a painful one coming at the hands of Scary Terry, who has been terrorizing the land for years now. Um, And really, it was a battle between two teams who are battling injuries just as much as they were battling each other. Uh, I'll start with Jackson. What are some of your initial takeaways from that game last night? kind of don't have any big takeaways from that game i wasn't like when i'm at games i'm not really on cast twitter that much and it seems like when i came back to cast twitter people were freaking out a lot more than they should i think sounds I, about right like like i remember tweeting during which you know this whole thing sounds like i'm like the center of my own universe which i mean you are but <laughs> at the same time this is a little too egotistical but like i remember tweeting about like during the Celtics game, I'm like, I think they're going to have a 2021 type collapse just because yeah, I know it's like no know out of it. And then, and then, and then Dean Wade happened. So people dunked on me, but it's like, I feel like we're kind of seeing that just because it's like, we're not seeing that much of a Because collapse. of the injuries. Just, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because this team's much more talented than that team, or at least like the remaining pieces on this team is a lot more talented, but I mean, this is just kind of if Darius Garland's your best player, or at least this version of Darius Garland, because I think we can all agree that Darius Garland is not this version of Darius Garland's not the guy that we saw last year or the year before. And I think that's mostly because of injuries, which is a reasonable excuse. But when we're talking about this team, like they don't have anybody who can get in they don't have anybody who can get into the paint. They don't have a great defensive structure with George Niang as the four. So this just really isn't, this is a pretty mediocre team and, you know, mediocre teams, sometimes they play really good and sometimes they play bad. And I think this game, they kind of played bad for most of it. They played good enough in the fourth quarter to win. And then they got really unlucky with, with Terry Rozier hitting a bunch of shots, but I don't think we learned anything about this team that we didn't already know, or at least that we shouldn't have already known. Yeah, it's hard to kind yeah. of figure out what this I'm team sorry. is because uh, you, 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 with so many interchangeable parts, you kind of know what the team's built to be, but because you kind of have to just plug and play, team, the team's identity is fluctuating on a night-to-night basis. So like Jackson said, like almost every game, you can't really pull out a concrete thing. It's like you can only pull out things that pertain to the game itself. We don't have stretches really where the same lineup is playing since – the original Darius and Evan injury where you had that like 20 game stretch of just knowing what that version of the team played like. And since everyone got back team, the players are just dropping like flies. Like we're playing like seven to eight man rotations at this point with players that we're probably not going to see in the postseason. And now it's back to a circa 2021 offense where it's mostly relying on the offense of Darius. But this version of Darius, like Jackson said, is different than the version of Darius we saw even when that team, was running around as Darius as the focal point of the offense. This Darius is very perimeter heavy and can't really do anything else if his shot's not necessarily falling because the threat of him attacking on the glass is just not there. And that actually brings up a good point that I wanted to hit on in this game in particular. But um, the broader thing that we're talking about here is like, yeah, the the Cavs, they're just so decimated by these injuries that it is hard for to take any major takeaways from this single game because it's like, these prop, this isn't the lineups that we're going to see in the playoffs. These aren't the lineups that we should be making our conclusions on this team on. Like we shouldn't be using that to make conclusions. And even if you compare it to that run that they went on earlier in the year when they were injured, it's like, yeah, they lost Garland or yeah, they lost Garland and Mobley, but they still had their depth. They still had Wade, Struess, all their, all those important pieces that were really helpful in that stretch. And also I think a lot of it came down to Donovan Mitchell was playing like an MVP candidate. Jared Allen made a late push for the all-star game uh, and they really just played amazing basketball when they needed it most. And right now you're not, you're getting great play from uh, Allen still. You're getting occasional great play from Garland followed up by not so great games from Garland. Um, But really, and this brings me to the point that I wanted to make about the heat game. One thing that stood out to me and it always stands out when we play against teams like this, someone like Jimmy Butler, who is just such a deliberate player, 
He's so methodical with the ball. Every single time Butler has it, you know he's going to create a shot, whether it's for himself or for a teammate. And even if it's a tough shot for Jimmy Butler, it's a good one that he's comfortable taking. The Cavs right now, Darius Garland isn't capable of doing that. Honestly, Donovan Mitchell isn't even really that type of deliberate, methodical player. He's a little more, you know, all gas, no breaks at times. Uh, and that's really – so it, it tells you two different things. One, it's part of why they miss Mitchell right now because he is just that incredible scorer who can get a shot whenever you need to. But it also shows you how even when they have Mitchell, sometimes they struggle to close games because it's tough to win – big games in the NBA when your best player is undersized. You can think of Stephen Curry struggling in the clutch because what makes Butler so difficult to guard in the clutch? He's He has size and he has strength, and he can basically just play with his back to the basket. And if they send a double, cool, someone's open. If you don't double me, I'm getting a shot. And it, it, even if it's a tough one, I'm capable of making it. The Cavs throughout this run have not had a player like that. And I think every time we play a team like Miami or Boston or any of these teams that have these wings who can post up and get a bucket down the stretch, it really stands out to me. I think that's kind of fair and unfair because I think Donovan is better than you're giving him credit for in terms of generating quality looks. I think kind of sure. the times where we've seen that be an issue this year is when like the game that sticks out to me is a Raptors game, like January 2nd where yeah. he like he comes down the defense collapses and he throws it to Isaac in the corner he misses his three then the next possession like Donovan says all right I don't trust Isaac I'm gonna try to take the shot myself and I think that's kind of like ideally you'd like to see him just make that pass to Isaac again at that time Isaac wasn't playing as good as he is now but I think someone like Donovan, he's really reliant on kind of the teammates that you put around him because what Donovan does well is he makes the he makes the defense collapse when he drives. He always does that. And he makes the simple pass every time, but he's not somebody who's gonna like pass people open or is like you know like you kind of know what I mean. So when you have him out there with like these two big lineups down the stretch that makes it really hard because that simple pass just isn't there and you can collapse a lot easier. So I would kind of just like to see this, this team with one big and one shooter out there with Donovan Mitchell down the stretch in these situations. Like I think that is a recipe for success, whether or not we ever see that because of all the uncertainties with guys like Struess and Donovan, where it's like, I don't know if we're going to see that. And that's where that's where the concern comes from. Mm, definitely. And uh, I didn't want to like unfairly lump Donovan in there too much. I, I mainly wanted to focus on that game with how like if you compare Miami's mm -hmm. process to what we what we were seeing from Darius Garland, like I guess a good way of shape or of phrasing it is that Jimmy Butler can bend the defense to his will. Whereas Darius, he just kind of has to take what the defense is giving him. The defense can dictate what Darius Garland is going to do more than you can dictate what Jimmy Butler is going to do, if that makes sense. And so that's why the Cavs have struggled to score during this time without Mitchell, because Mitchell, he is someone who can actually collapse a defense, apply pressure to the rim, and score in a multitude of ways. The only reason I brought him up there, too, is because I think in the playoffs, like bigger picture, um, it's still it, it's just so difficult to win with an undersized guard as your best player. But again, Mitchell is still, he's our closer, and I think he's capable of doing it. It's just something that sticks out to me. And if you're talking about this team in particular, like the, yesterday, Jared Allen went nine for 12 on shots at the rim and guys not named Jared Allen went seven for 12, which is concerning in the sense that they're just not able to even get there to attempt shots. And that's where you miss somebody like Donovan, just because this team doesn't have anybody who can do that. I think we kind of see like Isaac Okoro, somebody who can finish at the rim well, but when He's not playing with guys who can make the defense collapse. His kind of skill in that area kind of goes away, and I think that's a separate conversation. Mm -hmm. But that's where when you – like when Darius only has one way to beat a team and his outside shot isn't falling like like it was against like the Pelicans and Suns, then it's just very hard to have a good offense, especially when the game grinds down. And I don't think they really lost it on the offensive end. You know, I know that last possession was really bad, but – 
I mean, nine points in 90 seconds isn't something that you're ever going to expect. And it's not like Terry Rozier was hitting like uncontested shots. Hmm. So they were tough. I, I, yeah, I thought their execution, I really didn't have too much of a problem with their execution, barring uh, the two plays that stand out, which is the shot clock violation, which I don't really even know what happened well, there. Not, that just seemed like a, I mean, a botched Kar- play. Karras had a shot at four, uh, like four seconds. He had a shot. I oh, don't the, know. Like, yeah, like a, the mid range floater shot. Yeah. Which is his shot. Mm. Yeah, he loves it. <laughs> like, unfortunately, it's it. a shot, yeah. So. <laughs> Better or for worse. And then the decision for to take the layup without a timeout. I know people harped a lot on JB using his challenge. Probably not the best challenge, but it it's also a kind challenge. of situation. Yeah, but. It was like a two-second I mean, challenge. It was an like, obvious they, foul. They yeah, literally though, yeah. went and put their, they, like, put the headset on, and they, like, <laughs> hit play once, and they were like, Yeah. That's a yeah, foul, it, guys. It was an obvious <laughs> like, that enough was foul. A review. <laughs> but the, the main thing is, like, even with you losing that timeout, uh, they still had an opportunity to manage the clock and have it not be much of a problem if they get a three pointer. Shout out to Miami for not fouling while up three. By the way, uh, we respect it. So I think taking I the mean, layup there, you have to know that you you just can't take a layup at that point in the game. Uh, you have to get a three pointer up. That's yeah, and I think. <laughs> I think that's that's where you have when you have nobody who can create separation off the dribble, it's very hard yeah. to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's where I would have rather seen like me and kick it to the corner and have Sam just take an off balance contested three because maybe he can win. <laughs> like cause maybe he can make that. But there's no chance that they were gonna do anything at like two seconds left when Yang mm-hmm. got that. But that's more of a it's that's but that's just kind of who this team is. If you don't have anybody who can get anything off the dribble, I mean, it's a lot easier to lock you down. It's hard when the entire team is kind of built around one player operating with the ball. And then when that player is gone, then everyone's role has to move up a notch. And then it's like, well, the whole identity was built around one player's really particular skill set. And Darius and Donovan, mm-hmm. for as talented as both of them are, they both have completely different play styles with the ball. I mean, we saw it in that 20 game stretch when it was Donovan's show, the team ran one way. Then when Darius has to run the show, it's a completely different way of playing basketball. And it's not really necessarily complimentary to Darius' style. And Darius can't really play in the way that he would probably like to play, where he can actually be a threat outside of the perimeter. And Miami just took advantage of that the whole time, knowing that the Cavs' offense is kind of just hoping shots fall. And if they fall, that then that's great, because that's what all these runs have been without Donovan Mitchell. These Cavalanches are the team got hot at the right time. It's not that the offense, I feel like, is even necessarily clicking whatsoever. Yeah, and I think it's a little, like, I feel like I'm sometimes too hard on Darius, but it is fair to say that this isn't the guy he was in the beginning of the season. And I know he had all those turnovers in the beginning of the season, which we rightfully uh, criticized him for, by we, I mean I. Um, But he was also finishing at the rim at his career best rate. He was at like 60% through the first half of the season. which was. I think it might even been higher. Yeah, so that was... It was like a huge step forward and he was getting to the line. It was just, he was doing like dumb stuff when he wasn't trying to finish that through. Like I think about that game against the Sixers that like the game that everybody remembers Craig Porter Jr. for, but it was really like Mm. Darius was just finishing inside like crazy. And Mm. then when you get hurt and lose 12 pounds, a muscle after you spent the whole off season getting that muscle and that's why you were able to finish at the room like that's a big deal you can't put on somebody like Darius can't put on 12 pounds during the season especially given Mm -hmm. how much he's playing how much how many games this team has and how short of the season he has left so that's a huge deal and that's kind of like it's like a lost season for Darius I think and that's not any fault of Darius it's just you know sometimes this is how the game works I feel like the way basketball is too, it's a very knee jerk reaction thing for us. As for as long as the season is, I think people think if they see the body of work of one season, they think that tells the story for how the rest of his, his career will go. I mean, Jared Allen had one bad playoff series and we were ready to cast him off to a completely different team. They didn't, you didn't really look, if you look deeper into it, you can see the reasons why Jared struggled within the series. If you look deeper into Darius's season, there's been like, four different phases of a season for Darius Garland. And they're going to look at probably the playoffs, which depending on the team they play, I imagine his matchup will probably be pretty tough. And because he's going to be so like, I don't even like under bulked, I guess (laughs) it's especially considering the physicality of playoff basketball, 
it's just a recipe for people to leave whatever series the Cavs exited and go, well, Darius obviously is not meant for the playoffs whatsoever. And I wouldn't be surprised, though, if in the following season we see a Darius Garland that reminds us more of what we saw at the beginning of this season. Hopefully the turnovers get trimmed down. But some a much more threatening Darius Garland offensively. One of the things that I'm kind of interested in is how, if Donovan's able to come back fully healthy, how this version of Darius pairs with him. Because we really only saw it for two games where Darius was really pulling because he's been he's been pulling from three like crazy and that's been yeah. a great development for him and i think he's somebody who at this point would welcome playing more off ball in a way that other times donovan has played with him he hasn't really tried to play off ball or welcomed that so i'm really interested to see how they pair together and i think that you could talk yourself into this being a better situation for them to gel better if you the best version of of, uh, Donovan, which we don't know if we'll ever see that again this year. But in (laughs) the short term, well, I mean, (laughs) he was was so... He looked like... He looked like Cavs Dwayne Wade in the two games he was, like, (laughs) playing. Yeah, that that Houston game, I was looking back at some of the clips and, like, zero explosiveness. I mean, he could not turn the corner against people, so... That's a big concern. That's something that right. has to be worried. Right. And that's, yeah. So, and it could be like, oh, he just needed an extra week mm. and he looks fine. But it's like, we don't, I don't know. You don't know. So, you know, you can't, you just, you just, I just know what I saw last. And what I saw last was not very encouraging. Mm. Especially yeah, if we uh, know how good Donovan is. Yeah. Uh, bringing it back to Garland and the point that you were making there, I do think that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's a lost season yet for Garland. It could end up being that. It's been such a weird season. And as Corey was saying, like there's so much context there that people need to look at the big picture. There's all this discussion. Like I think it's year one of Garland's contract, right? The the max that is hitting. Listen, I I'll go on record. I'll bet that for the majority of the contract, he'll probably play up to that number. This season, you could argue maybe he hasn't. I don't really care that much. Honestly, it doesn't change the way that I view the game, but I think people just they get so hyper fixated on the bad games when, I mean, let's be real, just a couple weeks ago, he had 34 points, eight assists, and an overtime win against Minnesota. That was a big game. He had a big game against the Pelicans. I thought against Miami, he started off very poorly, and maybe you could argue he wasn't enough at the end, but I thought his execution down the stretch was good enough. He hit uh, Niang in the corner like four times, and I think they scored once off of it. Niang hits one of those threes, it's a different game. Uh, Rozier misses one of those threes. It's a different game. It was great defense by Okoro. Sometimes, like, I honestly think the Miami game, as much as it was kind of an ugly rock fight for both teams, I wasn't too upset about how the Cavs played. I think it was just a hard-fought game. They ended up on the wrong side of it, and you want that back. If they could clean up a few things, they win, but I wasn't too upset about it. Uh, The last thing I want to say about Garland, real quick, just to hit on what you guys were saying, with the turnovers, I'm not really, like, he's he's such a high-usage player that he's going to turn it over the turnovers that I don't care about. And no turnover is a good turnover, but if he's being aggressive and trying to find the big men or whatever, and he turns it over, that's fine. The turnovers that were horrible were the ones in the beginning of the year where he's like floating it into traffic. And it's like that pass has no chance of getting there. There's no zip on it. Those are the bad ones. And I think he has mostly cleaned up. Most of the turnovers we're seeing now are just being aggressive and you're going to naturally turn the ball over when that happens. The nature of those turnovers, too, is like there's such a fine line where you want your point guard or your facilitator to be aggressive because the aggressive mindset is what generates the nice passes that you're like, oh, he really threaded it in there. But with the uh, type of confidence it takes to make those passes, you're also going to get the ones where they're kind of going for like the flash. And I feel like a lot of Darius's turnovers in the beginning were like was an example of like overconfidence, which you want from your player. But at the same time, when it doesn't go right, it looks super ugly on the on any play and you can just clip it and be like look how awful his vision is on this play like what is he seeing Mm. i think i think a lot of his turnovers also come because he can't finish at the rim so if you can't finish at the rim and you're driving inside you have to get a pass off because you are not confident in yourself to finish at the rim and you've tried enough to know that like that's not the best play so when you get in those situations and the defense knows like hey he's gonna try to pass it it's like it's really hard to make the perfect pass in those situations. So 
it's just kind of a it all just snowballs together to have this version of Darius just kind of leave you wanting, even though that doesn't mean he's a bad player. It's just the current circumstances around him, this team's construction, and not having another guy off the dribble who can do much besides Karis LeVert. It's just really tough for for um, Darius after losing 12 pounds. Yeah, and I want to focus on what you just said right there, too, because we've gotten some comments. It's it's so funny. I've, I've said this a few times on Twitter, but like the difference between how this show and myself are perceived on Twitter as being the number one Darius defender. I shamelessly defend him. I just I won't I make so many excuses for him. But then on YouTube, everyone's like, why do you hate Darius so much? It's like, guys, listen, everyone here. I, I'll speak for all of us. I think we all love Darius Garland. We all think he's good at basketball. We all are doing our best to analyze why he's been coming up short uh, sometimes this season compared to the player we saw in the past. He's still very good. He's still having it. Like by most player standards, Garland's having a really good season. It just hasn't been consistent. And I think we're doing our best to provide all the context and explanations for why that is, whether it's roster construction to a shooting slump to uh, the injury that he had and the weight that he lost, like, it's, we're trying to look at the full picture here, and I don't think any of us are trying to be overly negative or overly positive. And this team needs so much from him because mm. it's really for, for like ball, for like ball handlers. It's Karis Levert and Craig Porter Jr. and that's it. And Craig Porter and Jr. has been not he's been good. Rough. He's been yeah. he's been not good since like December ish. Yeah, it's been I, like, I did want to, I had that in my notes too. I wanted to briefly hit on that. Right. So that just makes like, because if you got the November, early December, Craig Porter Jr., I think this is a lot easier or mm-hmm. like, you know, this isn't as big of an issue. What, what Darius's problem is, but, but like, right, like right now you're not getting a good Craig Porter Jr. And Karis LeVert has been great, except for those, yeah. those couple <laughs> brain farts except for the Karis LeVert moments that (laughs) he's been Karis LeVert is all you had to say basically (laughs) right and it's just like it's just it's just really annoying when Karis LeVert doesn't do the Karis LeVert thing but does the Karis LeVert thing and Mm. I I know that that makes sense so it makes it makes perfect sense uh Karis has been really helpful just because uh yeah yeah the, the the thing I wanted to say with Craig just quickly is that especially the last two games, it's been so tough for him to be out there. Uh, TJ McConnell was just busting his ass. And it's like, that's one of those situations where if Craig goes on a podcast 10 years from now, they're going to ask him, you know, who's the first NBA player to bust your ass? You just say TJ McConnell. Everyone's going to be like, TJ McConnell, really? But it was rough. Uh, Craig was getting, he was, he was taken to school there and he wasn't great against Miami either. And again, it's not to say that Craig's a bad player. Listen, I've been on the Craig train since day one. He clearly has proven himself as an NBA player. He has a standard contract now. He's a rookie, and and he's an undrafted rookie. He has room to grow. He has things to learn. It's tough to be a rotational player on a team that is competing for the second seed, whether or not they get there. It hasn't been that great recently. So I just wanted to highlight that because still to this day, we see people saying, why isn't JB playing Craig? Why isn't he getting him out there? It's like, listen, I wish Craig could be out there longer too. It's just the actual results we're seeing on the floor haven't been that great. That's why Karis LeVert has been helpful is because he's kind of doing what Craig was giving them back in December. Yeah, and they, I think, like, it's really tough to go from playing, like, six minutes a game. I think that's the hardest, that's the most difficult, like, number of minutes per game that you could possibly play. Just because you go out there and you're trying to make an impact that you know that your second half minutes aren't guaranteed. So Mm -hmm. you're, like, pressing and not letting the game come to you, and that's kind of how you get games like games like you've gotten or you come out and say i'm just gonna let the game come to me and stuff and then you just don't get second half minutes because yeah <laughs> why, why would we give you minutes if you're out there and you get one rebound in six minutes and you are over one from the field so that's where it's a really tough balance for craig and i think i think the Cavs ideally wanted him to play with the charge for like the end of the season because we saw him go down like the one game they were healthy they were like, okay, we're gonna send Craig down, but then the next game he had to come back. They up weren't because, healthy anymore <laughs> because they weren't healthy anymore. So, so that's where it's like it's just not a ideal situation for Craig. So, mm. I mean, I, I I'm not out on Craig long term. It's just like neither am I. Yeah, he's he's not. not he's he's, he's had not a handful of good games. Right he, he has had he has had a handful of good games recent uh, like 
since December too. I want to be fair. It's not like he's just been horrible every appearance, but he's had a couple games that were decent. And it's like the game that I think stands out is like that Suns game, but I don't think it was like that good of a game. I think it was just kind of like the Suns were putting like three guys on the ball. Like it was like a, they were treating yeah. Darius like he was, <laughs> you know, like a high school that only has one guy who can like play basketball. Like yeah. <laughs> that's how the Suns defense was treating Darius that game. So Craig looked a lot better because he was catching the ball with so much room. But when you're coming in and you're not playing with the Darius Garland, that's going seven for nine from three, it's a lot tougher. And I think that's what we've seen. Mm. Uh, Corey, I want to flip this one over to you because I think one thing that is going under the radar a little bit, maybe not completely under the radar, but what maybe fans don't realize is impacting the team as much is I think they miss Max Struess a lot. I know they miss Donovan. They miss Evan Mobley, but I really think this team is missing Max Struess. What is, can you just talk about that? What, what does Max Struess bring to this team that they aren't getting right now? I think when people talk about Matt Struess, that their, all their gripes this season was that he wasn't the flamethrower he was in the postseason for the Miami Heat. But what he's done instead was he was a guy who was just a solid three to have in the rotation. And if there's anything that any Cavs fan knows from like the past few seasons is that this team severely lacked a continued solid three output. And Max Drews checked all the boxes. I mean, he was a good – he played good defense. He was involved on every possession. He had good rapport with the two bigs. He was kind of like another ball handler at times. And when the team necessarily needed someone to have the de opposing defenses respect someone on the perimeter consistently for as little as success as he was having offensively, the teams, the defenses were still all draped all over him. And they only really get that from – Sam Merrill, but Sam Merrill also doesn't play the minutes that Max Struess is playing on a night to night basis. So I think the Cavs are true, like they're obviously very much missing their starting players, but Max Struess is someone that for a majority of the season was just continuity through and through. And they're definitely missing that, I would say, because the team is fluctuating on a night to night basis. You truly don't know going into any game what you're going to get out of the starting five. I think the best way to say it is the Cavs need guys who can pass, dribble, and shoot. And every time we look at this roster, we say, Would help. "This guy, this guy can, this guy can dribble, this guy can shoot, but he can't pass, or this guy can do one but not the other." And you know, Isaac Okoro sometimes he can shoot, sometimes he can pass, sometimes he can dribble, but it's never like all together. Whereas Max Struess, he can always pass, dribble, and shoot, and that's what that's what you need in the playoffs, and that's what you need when you don't have your star player. And that's why Karis LeVert has been so helpful. That's why Karis LeVert has been a, has shown to be a quality playoff player and play in player when this team needed him most. It's because he has that skill set, and the Cats just don't have many guys who can do that. And it's also just that continuity of having Struess in the starting lineup. Right now we're seeing LeVert in the starting lineup. We're seeing Niang play more minutes than he normally would. We're seeing Okoro have a larger role. Like, Part of the reason why so many of those guys were able to excel during that run with Mitchell is that, again, as I said earlier, that depth and their continuity in the rotation stayed pretty similar. Again, they lost two of their best players, but the rest of the team was healthy. And right now it's just all been mixed and mashed up. And no one like Karis LeVert shouldn't be in the starting lineup as good as he is. It just throws everything out of whack. You want him coming off the bench. You want Max Drews being that connector piece in the starting lineup. You also want just an adult, someone who takes the game very seriously. Um, I know the Cavs, even when Struess is out there, they'll have those weird games where they don't come out with energy right away. But Struess is never really the guy that's going to do that. And it's just, he always just adds a whole new dynamic to the game, um, whether it's handling the ball, operating pick and rolls, and and even in the closing lineups, just having someone who's calm, experienced, he's he's been there before, it just helps a lot. And the Cavs are really missing that, I think. One of the things that they're also really missing is the lineup versatility he provides because he's somebody who we've seen multiple times close games at the four. And JB has tried to run minutes out there with Isaac at the four, which I thought against like smaller teams. And I thought like, oh, this would work. But then you watch it for two seconds and you're like, this does not work. So that's something that, you know, Max can do, and that's just an element that they don't have without him. Like you talked about, George and Yang missing a ton of threes in the corner. Well, it was either George and Yang misses a ton of threes in the corner, or 
you know, Morris misses a ton of threes in the corner, probably. And neither option's really, like, ideal. So, The, but this, if you have... the data doesn't back that up. Morris is a flamethrower. Exactly. Uh, right. <laughs> but if but if you had Struess on this team, you could say, hey, we're going to close with Darius, Levert, Isaac, Struess, and Allen, and say, yep, that's we have enough size, we have enough rebounding, and we have more capable offensive players at every position and they probably win that game <laughs> if they if yeah. they if they had that i mean it's like you know there's all you can point to a lot of games they wouldn't have won if they didn't have the option to use Struess's versatility mm -hmm. and i uh that's actually the last topic that i want to hit on real quick because me and Corey got to talk about marcus morris on in in we're out uh, last week, but we haven't had an opportunity to hear Jackson's thoughts on this. So very briefly, how do you feel about the Marcus Morris 10 day? He'll probably end up being with the team long-term or for the rest of the season, at least. Where are you at? Multi-year. <laughs> sure. So I, he's, he's getting the contract extension any day now. I mean, in the short term, they desperately need him because they don't have capable fours and they've mm. shown that they don't trust Isaiah to even get yeah. an opportunity really. So from that standpoint, yeah, like you need him on a 10 day contract, but I don't, I don't buy the whole, we need a tough guy thing because if like, I do buy it, if say the tough guy was going to play basketball, but ideally yeah. this, but ideally, which is, he's not a tough guy, but if, <laughs> if like tough guys on the bench, I'm not sure what tough guys on the bench provide you in a playoff setting. And that's where, like you can have concerns about the Cavs being bullied in the first round or the playoffs again. And I don't think Morris is going to like change that because he's going to be sitting next to JB. So that's where I'm kind of like, I'm out on it in terms of like it actually changing things. And I would have rather seen, I might've preferred them just to give uh, Imani the full contract just to say like, hey, we trust you, we believe in you long term, but you can't really fault it now with mm. all the injuries that they have. So because yeah, you know, I I think I think we were all expecting Dean Wade to be back a lot sooner than Dean Wade has been back. So mm. that's and there's no timetable on when he's going to come back. So it's know. the bill for the team. There's no timetable for anyone to come back. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, yeah. I'm with you there. I think fully healthy, you still have Dean Wade taking up the majority of those minutes. At least I would have Dean Wade taking up the majority of those minutes. And I would not be surprised at all if Morris doesn't play, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he ends up replacing Niang in the playoff rotation. However many minutes that is, even if it's a small role, I would not be surprised if at least I felt like I trusted him more than Niang just because of defensively. Listen, Morris is, not, is nowhere near the same defender he used to be. Um, but he's, he's, he can still shoot the ball. I think he can move his feet better than Niang. Um, and that's I just, a high bar. Yeah. <laughs> I, listen, I know that's not exactly hyping him up all that much, but I just I think it's a low-risk, moderate-reward type of signing is the conclusion that we reached, uh, me I and Corey, think, I think. I think if you're relying on Morris minutes in the playoffs, yeah, that's what, I, think yeah. you're, I think you've already lost. You know, like you're already not going to be as good as you want to be. You know, unless unless Morris, you know, has an unbelievable shooting stretch, which I guess. And if he plays like he did in against Indiana, then that's. I mean, I would gladly yeah, take that type I mean, of guy. But are you gonna? You, you wouldn't expect that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, if if Corey could guarantee you four for seven from three every night, I think JB <laughs> we throw him out would, there. Yeah. Hell yeah. Corey so, pick and pop. <laughs> right, <laughs> but you know that's that's not really a something you can bank on so oh what the hell uh, wow <laughs> clearly you've never hooped with Corey because yeah uh, you wouldn't i be have saying not that. i have not. Connecticut <laughs> hoops run different you know we're i've never even hooped factory. with tony he does it's true every time every time he plays he, he sends me a text after, listen oh, i i played basketball I like once you. in the last seven months so that's not exactly true but He's once since like lab. november i have been <laughs> no <laughs> really haven't all right well you know our guy well my guy there's his wedding photo right there that he just sent me. Shout out to Ikrami. Uh, wish he would come back because he was the one who ran out the basketball courts. And since he moved in November, I haven't been able to play basketball. So that's why Jackson hasn't played basketball either. Because right. I just haven't played. I can't invite you if, we're, if I'm not playing. Cleveland people, leave, leave comments in the <laughs> YouTube. 
<laughs> about setting up a uh, setting up a basketball run. Remember when Mac was like, "Oh yeah, I'm going to set up a run <laughs> yeah. with everybody on Twitter." Yeah, didn't didn't quite happen. Where are you, yeah. Mac? <laughs> Mac, we need you. We need you to get this together for us so we can play basketball. Connecticut yeah. people in the YouTube, just keep rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Keep doing your thing. Keep the two uh, on people that note, listening. On that note, that's going to do it for this episode of the Junkyard Pod. I want to thank everyone for watching or listening. Uh, please consider hitting subscribe, drop a like, leave a comment on whether or not you think Jackson can defend me one-on-one, and go Cavs. I agree, go Cavs. Brian, what are your thoughts on the gambling situation? 